thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining us uh, in this session. Uh, welcome to the World Economic Forum on Latin America 2015 uh, here in Mexico and looking at the renovation agenda for Latin America. Um, we are very privileged to have esteemed leaders who are our co-chairs for this meeting. And they guide us and drive us on the uh, agenda points that we should be uh, thinking about and are planning towards in the coming years for uh, true long-lasting renovation. And let me introduce them uh, briefly to you, and then we'll have an opportunity to hear from each of them in turn on what they feel are the core points we should be focusing in on. Um, and then we'll have a, a brief opportunity for questions from the floor, uh, which would, I would ask, just in the interests of time, are brief and uh, focused on the agenda here at the World Economic Forum on Latin America. Um, so we are delighted to welcome Angelica Fuentes, who is the president of the Angelica Fuentes Foundation uh, from here in Mexico. Of course, we have Eduardo Leite, who is the uh, chairman of the executive committee of Baker & McKenzie, joining us from the US. Uh, Ignacio Sanchez Galan joins us from Spain. He is the uh, chairman and executive, ch chief executive officer, excuse me, of Iberdrola, of course. Uh, Carlos Slim Domit is the chairman of America Mobile. And uh, last but by no means least, to my left here, Joseph Stiglitz is a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in the US. Uh, so we are delighted and uh, honored to have them as our co-chairs. Now, very briefly, the renovation agenda discussion here uh, for, at the World Economic Forum is structured around three pillars. First, the foundations, and the foundations around people, around health, around education, around equality, around uh, gender parity, and that's where we start. And upon that, we build the framework, uh, a framework of a strong economy with robust infrastructure and links through trade and investment. And then beyond that, we put that to life through innovation, productivity, technology. And that's the narrative that we'll just use for this a particular session to understand the whole. And we would invite you then at the end of the meeting to hear from our co-chairs again about whether they feel those points have been addressed in full and where we go next. So first, um, I would love to turn to Angelica. Um, I was reading in the, the recent UN Women report that in fact participation in the labor force uh, among women has been amongst the strongest here in Latin America, but of course is nowhere near where it should be. Um, and the salary uh, disparity is still quite marked. Um, tell us a little bit about why this is so important. Um, what we need to do next, um, and what topics you would, what next steps you would feel are particularly important to hear from this meeting. Thank you. I would first like to illustrate um, what it would happen if we were to have or focus only on labor force. So I'm going to um, underestimate and talk about labor force. There have been studies by Goldman Sachs, by Boots and Company, by the IMF, where if only in labor force, which today is 80, 52 men, women participating in Latin America in the labor force, if we were only to have an 80-80 participation in the labor force, taking into consideration that, the, that a third of the women coming onto labor force will work part-time, which it would be around 60% uh, of, the, of the amount of hours worked by, by the people who are working full-time taking into consideration that uh, productivity, of course, will be lower because they will be coming new onto the labor force. We could increase just by equal labor force the GDP by 17% in Latin America. So I think that that really puts you know, a perspective or, or, or uh, where we can really be if we um, bring women onto the labor force. But in order to accomplish this, it's very important that the private and the public sector work together. Public sector, of course, you know, implementing public policy, and the private sector making sure that it gets implemented within the different um, areas in which it participates. And uh, in order for this to happen, we also need to have inclusion. 
It's very important to not just talk about you know, labor force. Imagine what could happen if the entrepreneurship uh, will come and play a role into this. We also need you know, on equal terms, terms for men and women, especially for women to be pushed and to be you know, supported and, um, and go into the STEM studies. And you know, last but not least, you said it, it's imperative that we have equal pay for equal work. Thank you, and thank you for broadening the conversation beyond uh, labor force participation. I'd like, Joseph, would you help us understand a little bit more about the, the broader picture here? I mean, we, we've had 50 million people overcame poverty in the last decade in, in Latin America, and yet poverty rates are still, I, I believe it's 28%, I'm sure, you know, better than I do. But help us understand what, what needs to happen next. And I, I really liked, Angelica, that you picked up the public-private aspect of this, this dialogue here. Such a big problem. Where, where might the solutions be if we talk about cooperation? Well, first, I mean, I, th I think one has to see the context, which is historically Latin America has been the region, of the, one of the regions of the world with the highest level of inequality. The second point, though, is that over the, broadly over the last 15 years, Latin America has been one of the better performing regions. So it had a very high level of inequality. It's come down. Really remarkable because it was at the same time that in the United States, inequality was really increasing. Some people said it was inevitable, that it, was, it had to do with globalization, technology. The successes of Latin America point out it's a matter of policy of choice. And Latin America did change a number of its policies. And those policies, I think, played a very big role in the successes, not in every country, but in some of the most important uh, countries. The third point I'd make is that, unfortunately, some of that success is slowed down. What's happened in the last few years, the, the, the progress uh, has been much more timid, and, and that obviously is a source of concern. Now, you asked the question about the private sector. At one level, the most important thing the private sector uh, can do is create jobs, you know, grow. Because when you know, the most important uh, weakness, the most important source of inequality is when there are no jobs, it drives down wages, increases inequality. So, in a sense, when the private sector is doing its main job, which is growing the economy and doing it in a way that creates jobs, it really is addressing the problem of inequality. But there are some other additional things. I mean, one of them is, as I said before, I think public policy is at the core of the ability to address inequality, reduce inequality. And it's important for the private sector to get on board that, uh, that agenda. Now, it was so interesting at Davos uh, this year, when they asked the business leaders, what, were the, what was the most important risk for the global economy? Uh, at the very top of the agenda was a worry about inequality. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, that's disproportionately reflecting the view of European business leaders, uh, not American business leaders. And I think it's important for uh, people in Latin America, business leaders in Latin America uh, and Europe to try to persuade their American colleagues that inequality is a global problem mm -hmm. and has to be addressed. Thank you. So there are the foundations. Let's build on that. Can I, can I yeah, just make please. one more comment because you said foundations. One of the important uh, ideas here is that actually a more equal society can grow more rapidly. That's why it, it, it really does belong here as part of the foundation. And that's something like uh, the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, has constantly emphasized, which is that economies with greater equality tend to have greater equality of opportunity and better economic performance, higher growth and more stability. So it really does belong here, not just as a social and a political issue, but also as an economic issue. Yeah, critical one. And then perhaps, Eduardo, I could, I could turn to you because you've written a great op-ed recently on, on okay, for, for the private sector to really get engaged in this debate, we need infrastructure. And you pointed in particular to the fact that we need to increase 
investment in infrastructure to, I believe, 5% of GDP, you asked. T tell us a little bit. I mean, feel free to talk more broadly about what you would le to like to see coming out of this meeting. But I'd love to hear a little bit more from you on that specific point about infrastructure as part of that framework. Sure. Well, certainly, the, we're talking at this uh, forum about the foundations for the new uh, future, or for the future of Latin America. And I uh, chose, the, I have chosen uh, infrastructure because I, I find it uh, also as part of the foundation for uh, the future of improved uh, movement of goods and services, uh, trade and commerce intra-regionally. And uh, we have a, a, a large, uh, ga a very big gap in uh, what is the size of infrastructure investment in other regions versus what we invest in our region. And the gap is uh, practically to double the size uh, from 2.5 to 3%. Uh, uh, we should uh, by now be investing at least 5% uh, more in, in infrastructure. And infrastructure would help uh, the region to act more integrated uh, but also, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic engine for job generation, which is much needed uh, for everything we're talking about, social inclusion, improvement of uh, income inequality. Uh, infrastructure is uh, an area where public and private can invest together and can find uh, great ways of m communicating better, setting the rules of the game, uh, Latin America in some jurisdictions uh, has uh, very modern, relatively modern uh, public-private uh, uh, partnership uh, laws. Uh, and uh, we haven't made uh, much progress in that direction. I think uh, the progress relates not to the absence of the rule of law or the uh, rules of the game, uh, but uh, the lack of dialogue and the lack of planning together public and private understanding each one's uh, needs and each one's uh, limitations. Uh, so in the end, I think infrastructure is also part of the uh, foundation of uh, what we expect from the transformation of uh, our region. Thank you. Inacio, take, take us beyond Latin America. Give us the, the global perspective. I mean, when, when we talk about the framework, we're l thinking not just about infrastructure, but also about trade and investment. And in doing my homework, I saw it, in Latin America, I think Chile is the only country from Latin America in the top 10 of our, our enabling trade report. So perhaps, what are your hopes for this meeting? What do you see as ways in which greater investment can be driven uh, into, into Latin America? Well, uh, I think uh, perhaps I will. Uh, there are already an important event, which is at the end of the year in Paris, which is COP21, which is probably is going to, to be one of the latest opportunities uh, of the uh, world to change the trend in terms of uh, 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 carbon emissions. So uh, I, think, I think in the point you mentioned about infrastructures, uh, I think there are one important infrastructure, which is electricity energy. So the uh, energy demand uh, in Latin America is going to multiply by four times in the next uh, uh, 25 years. So it will require huge amount of investment. It will require uh, almost one and a half to two trillion dollars investment in this period. And I think that is unique opportunity not only to make these infrastructures, but to make these infrastructures in a manner we will be environmentally and economically viable, and to learn from those uh, things which has not been done properly in other countries in the last few years. So I think uh, Latin America has already huge natural resources which can be exploited. Uh, uh, there are already huge uh, resources which can already uh, use and apply uh, existing technologies for making the things in different manner. But I think uh, it will require uh, uh, two things. One is the, the legal uh, stability and predictability, which I think uh, 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 globally in most uh, uh, Latin American countries, that is, the, for example, the case of Mexico, has already learned its applying since long time. But I think uh, for uh, infrastructures in general, require uh, investment which, uh, they, which pay back uh, uh, stand for 15, 20, 40 years. So I think when you have to raise such a huge amount of money to be injected into the system, 
this uh, legal framework, this stability, predictability, long-term planning is absolutely crucial. And, and I think that is, uh, uh, in the case of Mexico, we are in Mexico, that is one of the things which uh, the reform of President Peña Nieto is trying to, to make, just to create the, 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 the framework, to create the, 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 uh, the necessary rules for making it happen. And I'm sure that all the means which are put in the creation of these independent regulators to have already uh, uh, level pre field access to the to the grid, uh, level pre access to the uh, to the gas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that is going to attract a huge amount of money to this country, which is going to create that one. So, but uh, I think, uh, and, and I think is my my point with that one, is uh, 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 the fact that the the work cannot continue emitting as much as we've been emitting. So the Western, the, 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 the Western world is already trying to do something, but the, the emerging economies have to do their role as well. So because uh, if not probably uh, certain emerging economies which are doing things uh, moving in their direction, in another one we are not doing, they will lose the train of the, of the global in the future. Thank you. Um, I asked if you would take us global, and this is a key global challenge. So hopefully by the end of this meeting, we can talk about some of the sort of the pathways to Paris uh, on that particular issue and incredibly important energy reforms. So we've looked at the foundations. We've looked at infrastructure. We've looked at the energy. Now, perhaps we put a spark in this as well around innovation, because as we've talked about, the, the future will be between uh, countries that actually are uh, truly innovative. And uh, here uh, in Latin America, I think the average, average R&D spend is about 2.5%, I think, um, which is, how do we, could I ask you, Carlos, how, how do we take this beyond? How do we inject innovation, productivity uh, here in Latin America? What, what would your advice be? What would you hope to see from the meeting? Thank you, Elena. I, I would like uh, first to, to have, uh, take this opportunity to thank the World Economic Forum, Professor Schwab and Marisol for inviting me to co-chair this event in Mexico. I think it's very relevant that we have this opportunity in Mexico to have this such summit of leaders uh, discussing common agendas between the private and the public sector, particularly agendas to foster development, employment, and inclusion. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we are living in a new era. This era uh, is uh, very much supported on the ICT sector, no? innovation and communication technologies as the nervous system to make it, to make it happen. And I believe it's an era of inclusion, of, of access. No? It's an era that is giving us access to everything, to entertainment, to economy, to uh, information. But particularly, it's an era that should give us, through technology, access to education, access to health, and access to employment, and of course, to, to development. Uh, for this, uh, the sector uh, continues to have uh, a strong development. This is a sector that requires strong investments that are being uh, put on place on it for, for its development. But it requires uh, every time more companies and people getting into this infrastructure to generate innovation, to generate new content, to generate new services. And uh, I think uh, that, uh, as we have here uh, with the past uh, comments, that we're talking about three very important sectors. The telecommunications or, you know, or communication sector, that is uh, a very strong tool to foster the access in this era to all the, the issues that I mentioned before, but as well to innovation. The energy sector that will boost uh, a very strong investment opportunity for our countries as well as economic development for them and the infrastructure uh, growth that we require in our countries that will generate as well very strong economic activity and employment opportunities. So I think it's a, a very good stage to be discussing these agendas and uh, that it's, a, as I mentioned, a, a common agenda being discussed between sectors, between governments and private sector, and particularly between countries to do more, more collaboration uh, together. Thank you. And I loved how you brought it back to the start of the conversation, the link between innovation and then back to how we uh, make that uh, a driver of education, health, and social progress. Um, I hope you notice ev all of this is so interlinked. And, and as we've gone through the discussion, the, the connections between public and private sector and, and uh, having a joint conversation are so important. Now, um, I apologize. We've gone a little over time in terms of uh, the discussion. We want to leave a little bit of time for uh, questions from the floor. Um, 
uh, and then we'll break for the opening plenary, which starts in five minutes. I would ask that, just in the interests of time, do please keep your question very brief and to the point and focused on the issues that we are working with here in the next couple of days. So, uh, can I see a show of hands from anybody who would like to pose a question to our co-chairs? We have a lady in the front, just quickly if they have any. So, please, for you. And we have a microphone coming to you. Hi, uh, good morning everybody. Perla von Rostro from ICTSD in Geneva. Um, I'm sorry I was a bit late, but uh, I would like to hear you, everybody, about the gender um, equation in Latin America. What is the perspective of your institutions, your uh, companies? What are you doing in terms of gender uh, in the sense that we would like to have more women taking decisions? And, and, in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Just but we have one question at the back, and in the interest of gender equality, I will. Please, there's a mic coming to you. Just be brief, though, and then we'll bring the the questions to the group. Just keep your question quite brief, if you would. Eh, me gustaría saber cuáles son los principales problemas que ustedes ven en la región de Latinoamérica y especialmente en México. El web tenía un documento en el que hablaba de la desigualdad, la inseguridad y las bajas tasas de crecimiento. Si están de acuerdo con esos tres problemas que está mencionando el web. Okay, perfect. We have two questions here. I'm just uh, to the floor. Is there somebody who would like to take on a question to start with? I want to just uh, mention yeah, something course, that's very important. You know, when I was talking about public policy that needs to be implemented by the different um, governments for women participation to be more active, you know, that's that's something that needs to happen through, you know, different reforms or different change of laws or implementing laws, but. The private sector doesn't need any of those laws to implement a different policy within the corporations to have, you know, more uh, women coming onto, you know, the, the different uh, corporations. The, the thing is, how do we move from having the, the very base where a lot of women participate, creating that pipeline so women can uh, be part, especially of the PNLs of the different corporations, companies can do that. Um, you know, just by uh, being convinced, especially the head needs to be convinced that that is something that will be, um, you know, to benefit of the end results of the same. So I, I think it just needs to be uh, something we truly believe in and see the results on other corporations that have done that. Can I just mention Please. two points? One, uh, something very interesting uh, yesterday, uh, there was a big meeting in Washington sponsored by the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, which is a, a think tank that was created in the aftermath of the global financial crisis to think about new w ways of economic thinking. And they had a, a, a very interesting conference where they brought back, uh, together all the financial women leaders. Uh, and so you had Janet Yellen, who's the head of the chair, chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, Christine Lagarde, who is the head of the IMF. And uh, what they showed in this day meeting that actually uh, there are really now very, very top women. They've broken the glass ceiling, but it hasn't been as universal as it should be. Many people think we would not have had a financial crisis if we had women making the key <laughs> financial decisions, uh, that there would have been a lot more prudent behavior. The second point I want to make is, has to do with public policy, that uh, even in uh, a place, you know, countries like the United States, and even in Latin, in Latin America, they've narrowed the, the gender gap in education. Uh, they haven't narrowed the gender gap uh, as much as they should on pay. We mentioned that uh, before you came. And the second point is that there needs to be a public policy framework uh, on family leave, on uh, child care that really enables full participation. And that's a really big issue, even in the, in the United States. We'll hope it'll be a big issue in the 2016 campaign. 
Eduardo, Ignacio, uh, Carlos, if you'd like to comment on uh, sort of what your organizations yes. are doing or the importance, please. In 30 please. seconds, what are uh, private uh, entities or institutions like ours, uh, very global, very uh, widely spread on gender diversity, uh, we have targets. Uh, we have targets because in professional service firms, what we see is women are more than 50% at the beginning of their career. Then they go down and it's very hard to, to have a sustainable career because of the demands of professional service firms uh, to get into leadership. So we have targets uh, to promote women into leadership, but it isn't that easy, just the targets don't make it. We need to create the favorable conditions to coach uh, women in role models is essential. Uh, and we have uh, one of the best role models. Our former chairman was Christine Lagarde. <laughs> so uh, our chairman for Latin America, her name is Claudia Prado. She is uh, from Brazil. Uh, so we do a lot, but we are far from uh, the objectives. On the problems, I would say, the major problem that I see in our region is social and economic inclusion. And for that, uh, we need to make something that is really sustainable, not just charitable, uh, very uh, generosity is not enough. Ignacio. So, uh, well, uh, I think I'm very proud to say that we are on the largest uh, listed Spanish companies, the company, and, and the first in the utilities worldwide, we have more women in our board. So not only more women, but as well all the heads, all the chairman of all the committees, at committees of the board are chaired by women. And the women, which is, and the person which is already the special uh, responsible board member is a woman as well. And the person which is already evaluating the board and fixing my salary, so it's a woman as well. <laughs> so I'm very pleased. The company as well, we have already make a policy. Uh, we have given the example at the board level, but we have already made a policy for doing the same thing at all the management levels as well with women. Uh, for that, we have already created a special policy for uh, having a special treatment for those which are mothers in such a way they can combine the, their uh, family life with their professional life without affecting uh, their, their promotion and their life. So uh, uh, and that is one of the reasons why in most of the countries what we are, uh, we are the, the preference we just received uh, yesterday in our work in, in Brazil for all Latin America, the preferred company to work. And I think most of it is just because all the things we are doing for women. So I think I'm especially proud and that is uh, the thing. I think uh, with myself concerned, all my staff, with the exception of one, all are women. So all, all my, uh, let's say, my bodyguard are already composed by, by women, which I'm very satisfied with all of them. Last, co yes, last comment uh, to you, Carlos, please. See. No, just following with the, with the comments that, that they say, I think that uh, every time more and more is more an, an issue of skills more than gender, that that is very important. And we are as well internally fostering the development and the, 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 uh, the development of women within the organizations, but also in other levels to support uh, single mothers. Now we have a big base of single mothers in, in the retail space, for example. We are promoting together, as well with health institutes, lactancy uh, sp places within right. the offices and the work the workspaces, uh, and many other different activities that can allow women to be able to have the time to 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 work and combine uh, their family their family matters at the at the same time. So I think it's a, a and we are very uh, similar in those cases, taking into account the professional part the, and the personal part as well to help the development and, of course, the, the selection in the, in the top areas. Thank you so much, Petra. I hope you've got some good, I think you've got great answers there. So um, I would like to thank our coaches so much for their leadership, their guidance, setting us off to an amazing start at the renovation agenda with perhaps women at the heart of it, and also a strong collaboration uh, between public, private, and civil society. We're looking forward to a fantastic discussion here. Thank you for joining us, and I'm afraid we have to race to the opening plenary, so we will see you soon.